I will talk some about the implications for some parts of the world, but then I will turn to Spain uh, and uh, also it turns out Italy and Portugal and talk about some implications of research I've done about those three countries. In, in these three countries, productivity came to almost a full stop in the early to mid 90s. And so uh, the most important thing is to figure out how to get the productivity to grow again. Abrimos esta solemne sesión de recepción del excelentísimo señor doctor Finn Kidland como académico de honor. Ruego al excelentísimo señor doctor Xavier Añoveros Trías de Vés, vicepresidente de la Junta de Gobierno, tenga la bondad de acompañar a la presencia de todos los aquí reunidos a nuevo académico de honor, excelentísimo señor doctor Finn Kidland. ¿Ratificáis vuestra aceptación de ingreso a la Real Academia Europea de Doctores? Yes. ¿Prometéis cumplir fielmente los estatutos de la Real Academia Europea de Doctores y aportar vuestro saber y colaboración en vuestros trabajos científicos, tanto de carácter individual como colectivo, con el fin de velar por el prestigio de nuestra institución cuantas veces fuereis requerido para ello? His Excellency Dr. Alfredo Rocafort, President of the Royal European Academy of Doctors. His Excellency Dr. Antonio Pulido, the President of the Foundation Cajasol. His Excellency Dr. Joan Viñas, President of the Royal Academy of Medicine of Catalonia. His Excellency Dr. Josep Lupia, President of the Academy of Veterinary and Science of Catalonia. Distinguished authorities, their fellow academicians, ladies and gentlemen. Before to start this laudatio to present Dr. Finn Kinlan, I would like to thank the Royal European Academy of Doctors with a special mention to the president of this royal corporation for giving me the opportunity to be the introductor of, of an excellent friend of one of the most recognized economists in the world, Dr. Finn Erin Kinlan, awarded with the Serge Riesbank Prize in Economic Science in memory of Alfred Nobel in 2004, shared with Edward Prescott. For me, it's a pleasure, but also an honor. I have had the privilege to can call friend to our guests of tonight for more than 10 years. 
We have shared very good experiences and must say that every time I ask him to participate in one of our activities, he comes without any hesitation. He loves Madrid, loves Barcelona, and loves the food and wine of our country. But also, he has a permanent relation with the academic environment of Barcelona when he comes very frequently. I mean that this is a good time to acknowledge him for his friendship and availability. Finn Erling Kinlan was born in 1943 uh, on his grandparents' farm in Bergheim, Norway, and grew up in a rural Soiland, a small area of the township Hetzdal, about 40 kilometers south of Stavanger, which is located in the Herren farming region in Rogland County, southwest Norway. He was the eldest of six children and the only child in his class to progress beyond a very basic elementary education, going at, at 15 years old to high school in Brin. His father, Martin, was the eldest son and therefore in line to take over. He decided, however, to buy a truck, the first in the area to do so. He would base his living largely on a milk route between Soiland and the nearest dairy in Algard 15 kilometers away, <coughs> and also on hauling other goods, and in the spring ship to bitter pastures, returning then in the autumn. For the farmers, eventually he expanded to two trucks. His mother, Johanna, actually with 95 years old, recently rich, who is still, uh, still driving, and her license driver has been renovated the last month for two more years. She is going to dance, work at home uh, every day, and uh, she was working when they was a, a, on the children was uh, growing. And he recalls has a liberal upbringing; his parents not imposing many limitations on their children. Finn says that his father did well in school, although neither of their parents tried to influence their children in terms of career path. In fact, it came as a surprise to both when he ended up as an academic. As 15 years old, he went off to Brin to attend Rogoland Offenlingen Linges Gymnas to the nearest high school. The need, the need to rent a room was obvious, and probably half the pupils did so, as the distance to home made it infeasible for any of them otherwise to get to school in the morning in time for classes. Most pupils came from rural areas, as the cities typically had at least one high school. The, this particular high school required an entrance exam, which he passed it easily. As with all high schools in those days, one had to choose a concentration. This high school offered two, one emphasizing mathematics and physics, and one placing a greater weight in foreign languages, although all of them had English, French, and German for at least three years. Finn says ever, ever that this education was exceptional. He sometimes claimed that he knew more math at the end of high school than a typical American business or economics major, even at university as highly ranked as Carnegie Mellon, no at the end of college. As a consequence of his personal experience through his first 12 years of schooling, his bias has been the need for intensive education in elementary school, believing it's better to allow the pupils more time to play while they are kids and instead to emphasize the importance of great high school education. Whether because the student body was more selected than in most other high schools or because the teaching was first rate or both, this high school always ranked highly in terms of number of preceptor Easter, those students who had the grade of very good or excellent, the later almost impossible to achieve in absolutely all subjects. Indeed, to achieve the status of preceptorist was regarded as important enough all, all over Nor Norway to be worthy of photos in the local newspaper. In his case, he missed the, that distinction because of his grade in one subject, Norwegian composition. But his point score was still high enough to offer him the choice of just about all the university majors. His initial inclination was to apply to the university for engineering studies, not out of a deep interest in engineer, but more for the simple reason that he had had an easy time with math and thought that's where the skill would be rewarded handily. Still, he had a nagging doubt about that decision. So to give him extra time to think about it, he applied for one year teaching position at the elementary school of Altedal, the second largest town in Hesdal, and got it. <coughs> In those days, the short, the short gauge of elementary school teachers meant that such temporary years straight out of high school were not uncommon. 
Thus, he spent a year teaching fifth and sixth graders in all su subjects on Monday through Friday, and second and third graders in Norwegian on Saturday. Probably at that time, no one of such students could barely imagine that they was in front of a future Nobel laureate in economics. He credits his education there, particularly in mathematics, with giving him the choice of Norway's universities, but while pondering his decision, he took a teaching post in Oltedal Elementary School. The year at Oltedal Elementary School turned out to be important for his future. One of the other three teachers he met during lunch and other breaks was Harald Arrested, who taught a junior high school class in the same school building. Arrested had taken the initiative to start this program and thought all the subjects. Further evidence of his energy and imagination was that he had started and was running two small business. Finn found him to be an extremely interesting person. Because his accountant was making lots of mistakes, he encouraged Finn to take a correspondence course in accounting and then properly hire him as his accountant, a job he could uh, easily do in his spare time. This experience gave him insight also in what it meant to run a business, a subject about which he had here to know nothing. Business hadn't been among the fields he had even considered for study, but by the end of the year, he was so interested that decided to apply to graduate school of economics, which initially rejected him. Then an option open to him was to study for a supplementary exam in economics, law, business, correspondence in English, German, and French, and even in typewriting, which he declared with enthusiasm that has served him well ever since. And this uh, permitted him to make his uh, high school education equivalent to that in the business orientation. This could be done through correspondence course, which is what he decided to do. In the meantime, his colleagues and boss arrested encouraged him to stay for another year in Oltedal, teaching two subjects in high school, in a high junior program, continued to do the accounting for him and be fully in charge of running one of his two businesses, which imported tropical fish from Holland and distributed them to retail stores all over Norway on a profit-sharing basis. As a result of being busier than expected, he was far from being finished with his correspondent course at the end of the year, so he decided he might as well get his one-year mandatory military service out of the way and continue his correspondence course while in the army. The following May in 1965, he took the exam and did well enough to be admitted to the Graduate School of Economics starting that August. After receiving his bachelor in science, Finn Kinlan became a research assistant for his professor, Stan Thor, who was then a professor of economics at the Mansion School of Economics, uh, uh, abbreviated NHH in Norwegian, where he was finishing his three undergraduate years, made him an offer that would change dramatically the path he was to take for the rest of his life. He had gone to the business school with the expectation that he would eventually become a business manager. But when Dr. Thor asked if he would like to be his research assistant, uh, he agreed without thinking about what will turn out to be one of the most crucial decisions of his entire life. In the, in it's, interest that, uh, it's interesting that at this time he would be employed by the Department of Economics. Uh, as he had not shown any more interest in the economic classes than in business. Admittedly, as business schools go, the curriculum at NIH included a substantial focus on economics. The department housed several economists who were highly visible internationally. During his studies, he made a couple of wise, or in his own words, perhaps just luckily, decisions. The curriculum did not permit any flexibility except in two ways. One was to choose two elective areas of concentration, which students were to pursue by taking one course for each area per semester during the first two years. These ele elective tracks could be selected among four foreign languages, economic geography, economic history, law, and mathematics. He chose mathematics as one of the two, German being the other, and he even took two mathematic courses beyond the four courses sequences required for the elective. Another source of flexibility was that curriculum called for three relative advanced courses to be selected from an extensive list. His second wife decision 
was to take as one of the three the one offered by Sten Thor. In this course, the students read from Howard's book on dynamic programming and Markov processes and several later mathematical articles from journals such as Operation Research and Management Sciences. He wrote his first computer program in Fortran language, doing dynamic programming, a tool he has used repeatedly, repeatedly ever since. After he has finished the course, Stern recommend to him a summer job at the local shipbuilding company to work on a computer program designed to determine a reasonable ship size for any particular route, given the available da data on tonnage to be shipped and the per unit time it took the load and unload it. Mathematically, it was an application of fractional programming, linear constraints and an objective function consisting of the ratio of two linear expressions. Stan Thor encouraged him to become a research assistant as he was approaching the end of his studies rather than take a job in industry. And in words of a Professor Kinlan, he saved me from a boring life. But then, after he had worked a few months as his research assistant, Stan informed him that he would be going on leave for a year to Carnegie Mellon University, starting in January, and would feel like to do his research assistant duties there, and he agreed again. The second half of 1969 was when his fate was sealed. He would be an academic, and economics would be his field. In Carnegie Mellon, Finn takes some courses, but the most unusual the first spring was economic fluctuation by Robert Lucas. He started out with basic mathematics, such as Kahn-Tucker theory and functional equations interspersed with economic applications. As Finn says, one day, sometime after the midpoint, Bob Lucas started setting up a model. In the following class, he told us to scrap everything he had said the last time. He started over again, making a simplifying assumption or two, and then over the course of the next couple of lectures, took the analysis to its conclusion. Later, we realized we had seen his paper, Expectation and the Neutrality of Money, for which he was later to get the Nobel Prize being developed right there in front of our eyes. David Cass, who first encouraged Kinlan to expand an idea about non-cooperative and dynamic games into a thesis, and Robert Kaplan, his main advisor. When the proposed thesis was accepted, however, it was another new tutor and future long-term writing partner, Edward Prescott, who insists to be the Kinlan's mentor for his PhD dissertation, Decentralized Macroeconomic Planning. After earning his PhD in 1973, Finn Kindler returned to Bergen in Norway to teach at the Norwegian School of Economics because he felt obliged to take a position offered by NHH because he had provided full financial aid for his studies. In the own words of Finn, the first years at NAH was frustrating as it was clear that modern macroeconomics was not the school strength. Soon, he came up with the idea of inviting Ed Prescott to spend a year at NHH. He seemed interested, and he set the wheels in motion to drum up finally su financial support for his stay. He, su he succeeded, and Ed and his family show up in time for the 74-75 academic year. But that time, two significant things had happened uh, in, in the life of Finn. In his thesis, although describing three different solutions to the dominant player game, the recursive without commitment, the commitment solution in policy space, and the commitment solution in sequence space. He had calculated examples of only the first, in part because that was, the, he argued, was the candidate for an equilibrium. Also, the other two were much harder to calculate. In 1976, Kinler returned to the US as visiting professor at the University of Minnesota, followed by an appointment as associate professor at Carnegie Mellon. He remained there until 2004, before joining the University of California at Santa Barbara, where he's actually the Henley Professor of Economics. At UCSB, he founded the Laboratory for Aggregate Economics and Finance, LIFE. LIFE was established in July 2005 to address important questions on growth and fluctuations in national or aggregate economies. As a curiosity, I will let you know that life is similar to the Norwegian pronunciation of Leif, 
as in Leif Erikson, the great explorer and first European discoverer of North America. And exploration and discovery is what life is all about. This prestigious center of research is directed by Professor Finkinlen. Four leading macroeconomists from outside UCSB serve as advisory to LAEF, their charge being the identification of timely economic questions, issues, and or anomalies, uh, an anomalies which may be addressed in a conference or workshop setting. In addition to sponsoring conferences and workshops, the lab provides an environment in which to conduct topical researches in quantitative aggregate theory by residents and short-term visiting scholars. He holds the Richard P. Simon Distinguished Professorship at the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon. He's a researcher associate for the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and a senior research fellow at the IC2 Institute at the University of Texas in Austin. He has held visiting scholar and professor positions at, among other places, the Hoover Institution at the Universidad Torcuato di Tella in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Kidland's area of expertise are economics in general and political economy. His main areas of teaching and interest are business cycles, monetary and fiscal policy, and labor economics. Finn is married with a beautiful and also a very brilliant lady, Tonia Schuller, and has four children, Eric, John Martin, and daughters, Camilla and Carrie. Also, he has two step stepchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, macroeconomics is a delicate balancing act for government policymakers whose aim is to keep inflation low and to foster an environment to boost manufacturing and employment, thus creating long-term growth. But time is not on their side. Inconsistencies creep in, which can ultimately result in policies leading to high inflation, the opposite of their stand aim. One factor is in tripping up policies is fluctuation in business cycles. Traditionally, this has been put down simply to variations in consumer demand, but in two joint papers in 1977 and 1982, our distinguished guest, Dr. Finn Kinlan, and his fellow, Dr. Edward Prescott, offered new approaches to the subject. It was their 1977 paper, Rules Rated and Discre Discretion, the inconsistency of optimal plans that highlighted the problem of time consistency for policymakers. They went on to analyze the driving forces behind business cycles in their 1982 paper, Time to Build and Aggregate Fluctuations. This work gave a new insight into the subject and laid the foundation for the new Keynesian approach to business cycles and was recognized by the Nobel Committee, awarded both of them with the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2004 for the contribution to dynamic macroeconomics the time consistency of economic policy and the driving forces behind business cycles. Moreover, he has studied the situation in Ireland and Argentina with the idea in mind that there is a lot for other nations' policymakers to learn from their respective successes and failures of these two nations. Obviously, it's virtually impossible to make a resume of all the aspects of the curriculum from Dr. Finn Kinlan on such short time but I would like to end this laudatio with the mention of other honors and awards received by Dr. Kinlan, his fellows of the Econometric Society from 1992. He is a fellow also from the John Stauffer National Fellowship in the Hoover Institution. Uh, he received the Alexander Henderson Award from Carnegie Mellon and is a member of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. Other interesting aspect of their life is his love for the soccer. From his more than 10 years in Argentina, he becomes a fan of Boca Juniors. And also, he's a good athlete. He was run four marathons. But nothing of that is important because, as our special guest tonight says, he is in a region. But his real and actual hobby is the blues. He owns several guitars that he plays and sings, as his admirer Eric Clapton does. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kinlan, for all of us, is a real pleasure and an honor to have you with us as part of this centennial institution. We are honored that you have accepted to be part of our institution as a new honorary member. Welcome to your new home in Barcelona. Thank you.
Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great honor for me. I thank you very much for having admitted me to this society. Um, and thank you, Jose Ramon, for your many years of friendship and uh, for your uh, detailed exposition of what has happened to me, both uh, childhood, growing up, in uh, college years, and of course, in my academic life. Jose Ramon left out a, um, a piece uh, after 1975. You may recall that he mentioned that I organized for Ed Prescott to come to, um, to, come to Norway, to come to Bergen, to spend a year. Um, he, he mentioned that I had done some work on, uh, on uh, game theory, dynamic game theory, and had tried out some solutions involving uh, some with commitment for the future and some that where it was assumed that no commitment was possible. It, during the year Prescott was there, that's when we decided to try the alternative of assuming commitment in, uh, in, po in the context of policy making. So we, we would be like the policy makers. Uh, we imagine they would have some objective and then uh, uh, the private economy would react. And that, that is of course an example where uh, the optimal solution turns out to be inconsistent over time. There will always be a temptation for policymakers to deviate from, from the, the optimal solution. And if they're tempted to do so, maybe more than once, things may turn out badly for, for society. Um, the, uh, so that was one of the things for which uh, the Nobel Committee cited us. The other was to uh, change the framework within which uh, macroeconomic analysis is done. It used to be that e economic models would be characterized by a system of equations uh, consumption function, investment function, labor supply function, labor demand function, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, it was trusted that one could use a statistical method to uh, estimate the parameters of su such equations. Bob Lucas, who was mentioned by Jose Ramon, he was really the one who uh, cut the legs underneath that, that uh, framework. Um, by showing that such equations would not be invari invariant to changes in policy, and then what good would they be? Um, now, what Prescott and I did was we made the assumption that policy was chosen, chosen through optimization, through uh, trying to maximize the outcome currently and far into the future of some objective function, um, and uh, during the year in, in Bergen, we, we made some experiments in which we realized uh, the benefits of being able to commit to that optimal solution would be tremendous, much larger than we would have anticipated in advance, a and hence the importance of that, uh, of that, uh, of that realization. Um, now, the, uh, the framework we, we used for macroeconomic analysis was we started with the objectives of people. We, we started with the dynamic decision problems of households, of businesses, and uh, it turns out you can calibrate such economies um, by making sure that the model economy is consistent with um, relations in the data fr that you know, know with high, high degree of uh, confidence, and then you can use those models to answer important questions. Uh, so we believe that doing so, we, we put uh, economic uh, 
on a much more uh, well-founded uh, scientific footing. Uh, and, um, but it, economics is still a hard field because people react to economic policy. Economics is much harder than physics, for example, where uh, particles just, they just move uh, whichever way. Uh, but in economics, you, you change policy and, and people respond. Uh, and, and this becomes very important dynamically. I thought I'd take the opportunity to, uh, to uh, talk about some examples of applications of economic theory, and uh, I intend to uh, eventually to, uh, well, I'll, I'll start with the, um, with uh, portions of, uh, or places in the world, but then eventually move towards Europe and then eventually towards Spain. Um, so um, I'll start off by showing some pictures of uh, what has happened in some parts of the world. And the main message will be that um, what we have learned about policy makings and the kinds of institutions that exist in parts of the world um, Countries with strong institutions will do better. Con countries with not so strong institutions will do more poorly. A and uh, so, so the, these, first, these first slides will be illustrations. Then I'll give you an example of a country that really managed to f firm up uh, or make economic policy certain, and remove all uh, certain uncertainty about fiscal policy in particular, and to see the implications. But let me start with um, an example of three countries. You, get, you may re, uh, regard them as, as benchmark, United States, Canada, and Australia. These have all done quite well. Um, this, this is GDP per capita, real GDP per capita, which uh, by an accounting uh, um, uh, um, relation, would also correspond to real income per capita. In, uh, so in, uh, in fixed uh, dollars uh, as of 2005, uh, the scale goes from about 10,000 to about $45,000. Um, now, next I'm going to sh show you three countries each from two different regions. The first region is East Asia. These countries are uh, Japan, uh, Taiwan, and, and Korea. So the, these have done quite well. I should point out that this uh, diagram is not on proportional scale, so that a, a given, uh, a given uh, slope of a curve high up in the picture corresponds to a significantly smaller annual rate of growth than the same slope further down in the picture. Uh, now the next region, I'll show, I'll show you three countries from, um, from South America. Uh, these are Argentina, Chile, and Mexico, or oh, I should say Latin America because Mexico is also included. Uh, so Chile, Argentina, and Mexico. And visually we can tell these countries have done much more poorly over time. So the, this goes from 19, these pictures go from 1950 to close to the present. So it, this suggests there's something about the institutions in those countries that makes it difficult for them to do as well as these, as these other countries. Um, I also threw in a couple of brand new countries suggesting that uh, all is not hopeless just because you got a late start. Here's a, here are two examples of very recent countries that came into being in, uh, in uh, around 1990 with the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. I like to use them because uh, Tanya and I have been uh, to both countries several times for conferences. Uh, they, they both had a rough beginning, as you can see, but uh, after about 10 years or so, they found a way to start going 
and th the growth rates experienced going into the 2000s in this chart because it's far down in the picture, those slopes correspond to much higher growth rates per year, annual growth rates, than the similar slopes high up in the picture. Um, we, we had the good fortune of being able to go to Cuba uh, about a year ago, and uh, Cuba, of course, is getting a new beginning. We were, I was asked by journalists, what do I predict about Cuba? And of course, no one can really predict because you don't know what the policymakers will do. But uh, my best prediction is motivated by the same kind of picture. They, are, they may have a rough time in the beginning, but if their policy, policies are wise, they, 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 should, they should do well. Uh, and of course, I can't leave out the country that's um, projected to become the biggest country in the world in terms of total uh, economic activity, um, China. Um, now, the uh, income per capita in China, it, it, to many, is surprisingly low. Uh, and, and I suppose it's a, an example that if you multiply a small number by a huge number, you can still get a large number. So, so, so the main point of this uh, picture is uh, different parts of the world have done uh, very differently. Some have done very well over time, some much more poorly, and much of it must have, must have to do with, uh, with the kinds of institutions that exist the kinds of uh, uh, political environment that exists in each of those countries. Now, one, one, ex one example that fits particularly well with what I said about the uh, uh, time and consistency of optimal government policy, which translates into the need for consistent long-run policy, if, if policy, if, if uh, a government cannot com commit to a good long-run policy, then, um, um, then uh, they, the outcome tends to be, become much more short-run oriented and, and uh, they tend to do more poorly for the country's citizens. Um, to me, the, the, the ability to commit to good fiscal policy is particularly important. Uh, fiscal policy has to do with tax policy, government spending policy, and, and so uh, government regulations. Uh, and, and so uh, let me use the example, an example from Europe. Uh, so these, these are four European countries that have done quite well, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and Austria. Um, they, they tend to follow each other quite closely. Then uh, in the next picture, I have uh, uh, three countries that have done not as well. There's Italy, Greece, and Spain. Um, now, I would like to add, and, and as you can see, uh, well, Italy did quite well for a while, but uh, they have fallen off, and, um, and uh, Greece and, and Spain are towards the, the bottom of, of these pictures. I would like to add one more country, uh, and, and that is Ireland. Uh, after the financial crisis, when Greece uh, went essentially bankrupt, uh, four countries were sometimes mentioned as potential future problem countries, namely, namely Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland. And, and so uh, I took a, a particular interest in those countries. Now, if I were to add Ireland to these countries. Here, here's a curve for Ireland. I, temporarily, I made that curve end in 1990. Uh, it, it may be a little hard to see, but uh, there is this brownish colored curve that uh, is a, uh, it, it ends kind of on top of the curve for Spain uh, in 1990. Temporarily, I made the curve stop in uh, 1990 because I want to tell you what Ireland did around that time. They decided to make 
fiscal policy, tax policy in particular, completely certain. No uncertainty about it. They said, if, if you, whether you're a foreign or domestic uh, 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 company, if you set up shop in, uh, in uh, Ireland, then these will be your tax rates, not just next year in 1992, 93, and so on, but all the way to 2009, which is, uh, which is the lifetime of even the longest lasting factories and, and, uh, and pieces of, uh, of capital. Uh, what, what happened? Well, within 10 years, Ireland had overtaken all, all the four top countries in this picture. They had surged ahead of uh, both the United Kingdom, France, um, Germany, and Austria in terms of income per capita. Um, <clears throat> as most of us know, they, they did run into a rough time in, uh, after the financial crisis because the banks, it turned out, uh, which were not, they were re insufficiently regulated and the banks had issued loans they should not have issued. And so with the, when the financial crisis hit, they ran into, uh, uh, they, they became un in liquid. The government decided to uh, bail them out at great cost to a taxpayer, but that doesn't take away from the great success of the, uh, uh, of the certainty about uh, fiscal policy that starting in the 1990. Very important. Uh, now, as I mentioned, I, I took particular interest in these four countries that were mentioned as potential future problem countries. Uh, I tend to put a lot of weight on country's productivity. So um, um, the growth promoting decisions made in, in, uh, in uh, different economies, uh, they have to do with innovative activity, extremely important, taking advantage of the resulting technological change to build productive capacity to, uh, to, to as I said, to take advantage of it Businesses hire workers to uh, better, better paying uh, jobs and the, and the nation's citizens do, uh, do better over time. Uh, but these are all very, these are these important decisions, innovative activity and, uh, and capital formation are very forward looking decisions and they require uh, looking ahead to see uh, what future government policy will be because the, they're expensive as they take place and the returns come over maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years in the future and these returns are affected by uh, future economic policy. The more, we, the more confidence you have in that future economic policy, the more inclined will business will be to undertake those decisions. So, um, but as I said, uh, prog productivity is all important. And here are four pictures. Uh, at the top left, Spain, top right, Italy, bottom left, Portugal, and bottom right, Ireland. These pictures go back to as long uh, where data start, 1960 to, uh, to the present. <clears throat> um, and these, in these pictures, you see that productivity in, the, in, these, in these two nations, it says TFP, TFP that's, we call that total factor of productivity, an important concept for uh, de, uh, indicating uh, nations' productivity. Uh, in all four countries, productivity grew at acceptable levels until about 1990. Then it came to a full stop. When I saw these pictures, I was shocked. How can productivity stop growing entirely? Uh, it's true for Spain starting in 1990s. In uh, Italy, this full stop started a few later, years later. In Portugal, maybe a couple of years later. Uh, another way to measure productivity is simply to look at output per capita, output per hour worked. So per hour worked, 
by the average worker, how much is produced. Uh, these pictures basically uh, give you the same message. Um, so uh, after the financial crisis, I was sometimes asked, uh, what do you think about the reasons for this? It, does it have to do with the euro, for example? Because often you heard euro being blamed for, for the difficulties, difficulties of these countries. Uh, because you, we are tied to the euro, we cannot do anything about the exchange rates, for example. Uh, we, that makes it more difficult for us to react. And I used to think that after seeing these pictures, uh, I, I thought this, the euro must be just a red herring as, as, as the term is in, in English, something that is blamed as, as a, the uh, real culprit, but it turns out the culprit is something completely different, a, uh, a, a red herring. Uh, and that's what I used to think for about three years until uh, I kept going to the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, where I've been a research associate, uh, as was mentioned, for, for many years, over 20 years. There's a Spanish economist there, Enrique Martinez Garcia, uh, and I kept asking him, what, what do you think is the reason in the context of Spain, in particular, for, for, these, uh, for these problems? And... Uh, he didn't really know, and uh, I, we both, I kept scr scratching the left side of my head, he kept scr scratching the left side of his head. Finally, it occurred to us what could be the problem. Uh, so, which led us to wonder, is it really the euro anyway? Okay. When we looked at the data, it turned out um, well, we sort of realized that, well, the reason I, I thought the euro, initially thought the euro was a red herring, both all three countries, Spain, uh, Italy, and Portugal, they be, became members of the euro well after the slowdown in productivity. Um, but then we realized, well, uh, it was clearly announced earlier that they were going to become members. And so um, um, when we looked at the data, it turned out as soon as the announcement was made that they were going to become members, interest rates, normal interest rates, fell dramatically. So in, uh, in, uh, in short, one can think of the normal interest rates, the interest rates we can observe, the ones being quoted in uh, papers uh, and so on. Um, they're the sum of three factors. The, what we call the real interest rate, a, uh, an inflation pe premium to uh, make up for the people's expectation of prices to in increase in the future, and uh, very importantly, a third component you could call it a country risk premium. So in some countries, because they're regarded as very safe countries, there's virtually no risk, country risk premium. An example might be Germany, where you're regarded as quite a safe country. In uh, other countries, for example, Argentina, regarded as a very unsafe country in which to invest, there's a large country risk premium so that interest rates tend to be higher. In, uh, in Spain, Italy, and Portugal, as soon as the announcement was made to become members of the Eurozone, suddenly country risk premium fell dramatically. Uh, now, I don't have time to go through the economic theory behind what happened. It turns out what happened fits well with um, economic theory in uh, international economics. What I'd like to show you are, are just a couple of f factors that play a role. Here, here is a picture of the um, proportion of, a country, of Spain's activity in what we call the 
traded sector or the tradable goods sector, goods that are sold domestically, of course, but they can be sold also abroad. And then the non-tradable sector, these are goods that are products by their nature, they can only be transacted within the country. Um, even I, every now and then, have to have a haircut. A haircut is an example of a non-tradable good. Um, or many uh, forms of a construction. I could give you a list of uh, non-tradable goods. As you can see in the picture, until about 19, until the late 80s, these two sectors were about equal, 50-50. But then um, the non-tradable goods sector started growing in relation to total to the uh, tradable goods sector. So by, by the end, by around, or oh, let's say 20 years later, the non-traded sector was two thirds of economic activity, the tradable goods sector only one third. Well, that doesn't need to be that bad, except if we look at productivity, and here, uh, uh, in the interest of time, I had to use some, uh, a couple of pictures from a, uh, article, uh, and Rick and I are in the process of writing this up, you get to hear about research being conducted uh, uh, these days uh, or these months. Uh, so ignore the uh, green and the red curve. These are output from uh, our uh, model experiment. Look at the blue line. That's uh, productivity, that's output per hour worked in the traded sector. Also, pay attention to the vertical scale. It goes from about 50 to over 200. Let's say between from 1980 to uh, 2010, uh, the uh, productivity in, in this sector grew by on the order of 2.5% annually. Acceptable rates. How about the non-tradable non goods sectors? Well, if you look at the vertical scale, this doesn't look very, very uh, impressive because uh, from 1980 to, uh, to the end of the curve, it moves from about, and this, these are indices, from 100 to only about 120. This turns out to be a growth rate per year of only a third of a percent. So about one-tenth as fast as for the traded goods sector. So this, this indicates part of the problem in the case of Spain. Um, now, one may, one may wonder what to do about this. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. I have about, let's see, 2035, is that what? Okay. <laughs> the time I was given. And, and that, that's perfect because I have one more slide. <laughs> So, so the, uh, what needs to be done in, in uh, and it turns out this is a problem also for, similar problem for Italy and Portugal. Um, clearly the issue is how can we get these curves to start moving back up? How can we make productivity start growing again? Uh, there are all kinds of factors that may play a role. There's the uh, policy environment, there's ex the extent to which uh, the innovators and, and the, uh, those engaged in building productive capacity, to the, what extent they have trust in future economic policy, as, as I've suggested. Um, these, these are expensive decisions. They may cost millions and millions of dollars as they take place and their returns come over many years in, into the future. Uh, how can we have trust in, in, uh, in future economic policy? The, the government can obviously put in place incentives or, or a, an environment whereby uh, one, ha one has the incentives to carry out innovative activity. 
development of new products, development of new ways of making things, more efficient ways of making things perhaps, and so on. Um, and also, there has to be an environment whereby one, especially the small to medium-sized firms or the beginning entrepreneur, where enter entrepreneurial activity is allowed to flour flourish. Uh, I, 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 early on in my talk, I emphasized the importance of consistent, good but consistent economic policy over, over time, uh, a commitment to, uh, to uh, the long run. Um, my example of that consistency of policy is not sufficient for a good outcome is China. To me, China is about as consistent, economic policy in China is about as consistent as they come. But to me, China is an example of consistent policy but bad policy. Um, the reason for that is in, in China, uh, the banking system, the banks are state run. They tend to favor the big uh, state owned companies or, let, or more generally the, the big well known companies. These companies until recently have had access to cheap labor. Uh, the the state run banks tend to favor them in terms of uh, who gets credit. Uh, meantime, the entrepreneurs, the, uh, those with the great ideas for new products, new, uh, new ways of making things, they have a hard time getting loans uh, to put their ideas to fruition. Um, economists obviously cannot run experiments on whole economies. That would be uh, immoral. But occasionally we're, uh, we're lucky enough it, uh, well, the, the, the countries are not necessarily that lucky, but we as economists are lucky enough to uh, come across experiments where two countries were in the same situation and the policymakers in those two countries took different decisions. And then we can observe what happened. So here, here's my example and that's, that's my last slide. Uh, in 1981, Chile, the blue curve, and Mexico, the red curve, they were in the same situation. Um, the pri prices of their main products, copper in the case of Chile, uh, petroleum in the case of Mexico, were very low. Uh, world interest rates were high, uh, banks were illiquid, Many banks in those countries were illiquid. In Chile, for example, uh, banks accounting for half of the nation's deposits were illiquid. The government stepped in. They decided which banks were viable for the long run. Uh, the remaining ones, they just let go under. The ones that were regarded as viable for the long run Within two or three years, they were reprivatized. Uh, and then uh, um, credit started flowing to interest rate, uh, market interest rates were uh, being quoted. Um, credit started flowing to the best proje projects as, as well as a well-functioning uh, banking system can, can do. Uh, this came at a fairly high initial cost. In this picture, you can see that these are indices, uh, 100 in 1981, and then uh, it dropped to about 80 in two years, so that's a 20% drop in two years. That's serious. Uh, but then the Chilean economy started growing. In Mexico, uh, the government was reluctant to reprivatize the banks that were in trouble. So bureaucrats took over, and so bureaucrats were in charge of deciding who, who would get loans and who wouldn't. Um, now, if you think that bureaucrats are the ones who have the best knowledge of what are the most important projects, you probably believe in Santa Claus. Uh, 
So in Mexico, the initial drop was much smaller, but it took, as you can see, it took a long time for the economy even to get back to where it was in 1981. I take this as a le lesson, not only to China, but also to, uh, to Spain or any country that it, in addition to the factors I've already mentioned, uh, uh, productivity promoting type, put, put an environment in place for productivity promoting activities, um, it's also important that there be a, uh, that the banking system be uh, set up or not to prevent the banking system from being able to or have the incentives for issuing credit to the uh, entrepreneurial, to support entrepreneurial activity. Um, so, thank you very much for listening. And uh, again, it's an honor for me to be part of, uh, of you all. So, uh, thank you very much. Es un verdadero honor formar parte de esta prestigiosa entidad y un verdadero referente en el conocimiento, la divulgación y la investigación. Junto a la de miembros de esta academia está, por supuesto, la de mi condición de presidente de la Fundación Cajasol, entidad sin ánimo de lucro que comparte con esta institución un compromiso largo profundo y firme con la promoción de la cultura, de las artes, de las letras, también de la ciencia, de la investigación y de la innovación como instrumentos absolutamente insustituibles para el desarrollo de una sociedad más abierta, más avanzada y de progreso para todos. Fruto de este compromiso compartido estamos llevando a cabo, como saben, distintas actividades en común, entre ellas un ciclo también de conferencias en Barcelona y Sevilla que nos está dando la oportunidad de escuchar y aprender de la experiencia, del trabajo y de las reflexiones de algunos de los premios Nobel de distintas categorías. En este caso, en este caso de quien hoy se incorpora como académico de honor, el doctor Killan, galardonado en la categoría de Economía en el año 2004 y a quien con muchísima atención hemos escuchado. Mi felicitación de nuevo como académico de honor al doctor Killan y a todos ustedes, muchas gracias por su atención. Muchas gracias.